So, welcome once again, we are taking gradual steps to come into the main themes of calculus. Today we are speaking about limits. Now, many of you, the more ambitious younger students possibly waiting urgently to get some knowledge about limits, about uh, derivatives, integrals and all those things. I would suggest that you would uh, keep this in mind that you would understand calculus far better if you know at the very outset that these derivatives and integrals are names given to some special kind of limits. So, limit is actually the most central and possibly sometimes viewed as a very slightly difficult concept in calculus and you will understand calculus much better if you know at the very outset that every continuous function did not have a derivative. We will come to all those things later. But First of all, let me tell you what is calculus actually, what does calculus study? But it is just to, is it just to write some derivative something from the air and then you just uh, get some marks in the examination, is that for the reason for which you study calculus? Of course, many of you would say, okay, I have to do it in my IDJ, I have to give my engineering exam math 1 course, so I will just do something, I have to know the tools, I have to apply it, blah, blah, stuff. But the real issue which is hardly seldom told in our class is, is that calculus studies change. It tells you that if I have a function written in this form y equal to f of x, then what happens to how, how does y changes when x changes? How does the function value change with the change of the independent variable, the, this the x variable which, which we call the independent variable and this the dependent variable. Calculus actually deals with the rate of change, change per unit time. So, time also gets linked with calculus. This variable largely has been time, talking about time. So, calculus arose because people wanted to understand motion. And if you read the or if you look at the history of calculus, it was essentially while trying to understand motion of bodies, motion of heavenly bodies rather that calculus first took its root and it first came in when people started talking about the velocity of uh, object at a given time, at a given time instant. So, what people like Newton and others realize that if I want to look at the velocity, the how a particle is moving, I can draw a graph and, and I can put this x t as a function of t as the position, because you can understand that you can always consider time when you are standing still at time t equal to 0, then you start moving. So, as you move the distance changes but as time flows, you cover more distance. For example, a train starts at 3 o'clock from a say the Howrah station and has to go towards say the Bandel, Bandel station. So, then for example, it starts moving at 3, at 3.15 it is in the next station Lilua and 3.30 it is at some other place, 3.40 it is at some other place and so on and so forth. So, distance is essentially a function of time. So, the graph could be straight like this or graph could be something like this. So, even at, even at discrete times you can do like this, you can plot it like this if you in observe it say after 30 minutes time interval assuming that time are given minutes or even seconds. So, at every <coughs> 60 second interval. So, it could be like that. So, as the train starts its speed increases and you see the speed is increasing and so you basically have some sort of an increasing function if you look at in continuous time. So, now the question is what was its velocity at 340? 340 pm what would be the train's velocity? If velocity could come down for example, it starts 
start to decelerate and stop at a station, its velocity could come down like this and it could be 0 after certain time means it has come down and stopped at a station. So, this could be the graph. So, now what, what is exactly the velocity at a given time t? So, you have a distance s is usually written as a function of time. So, if I do not, if you do not mind x t is the standard way physicists write. So, I will just put it in a mathematical way s is function of t, s is the distance and f t is the function by which it is related with the time. Is the train speeding with the distance or it is slowing with the distance, everything can be captured. So, you can so, so time, so at every time we see the nature of the motion of the object. Now, if I say exactly what is the speed at this time, you might say oh come on it is so difficult to find exactly what how, uh, because an instant of time merely passes suddenly you are you are in the past and suddenly you are in the future you hardly understand what an instant is but this notion of instantaneous velocity has severe and important ramifications in physics and also for mathematics so how does one do it one says okay let me see what happens if I see the, if after a very small amount of time say delta t, just delta is to talk about very small time. So, so what is my, so need I have a, so s dash I come to s, I was at, at time t I was at s at time s dash at the time t plus delta t at a very small time I am at s dash. So, this is my distance. So, assuming that over that period I have moved in a given direction that is I have not changed my directions much. So, for a very very small instant of time. So, we can con compute the average speed over that that distance which would be f of So, this thing is also written by the physicists as a change in the distance, very small change though. So, you can make the change on the for example, at this point you want it, say at the point t you want it, but you can make the change either here t plus delta t, t could be positive or it could be t minus delta t, whichever way you want. You can look at what was the velocity. So, you are looking at the velocity, you are looking at the distance it had covered just few minutes, few seconds before or just you are looking at the distance it has covered few seconds after, you can do either. Of course, you, you can say this though instantaneous velocity is a very strange thing to think about, but at time 340 it did the train did have a velocity right. Then the question is if I know the velocity you know, of this or the, the time that it the distance that it has covered in this small time period and then if I make the time period much smaller and smaller and smaller, so small that the time period goes towards 0, then possibly what I have at the end is the instantaneous velocity. So, this brought in the concept of now this whole thing is a function of t because ultimately everything is depending on the choice of t the delta t. So, if I fix the t then it is the choice of delta t, delta t can be now changed. I am making the intervals around the point t smaller and smaller. If you want to be more comfortable you can put t instead of t, t 0. So, this is delta s by delta t which is a function of t. So, delta s is a function of delta t. The change in velocity, the change in uh, distance is a function of the change in time. Now, I want to know what would happen to this change, this, this rate of change or this velocity. Uh, so, how much has the velocity changed? So, what I am measuring here is the distance covered by the time. So, average velocity over this small interval 
of time period, the small time period. So, I want to know if this small time period be made as small as I like, I can make it as small as I like. And basically, I want to in my mind shrink it and bring it to the point T. Will this ratio move to any anywhere? So, taking this process was understood and called by Newton the notion of a limit. So, so as I am making the time go towards 0, the change in time go towards 0, this average velocity over this very small time period is going to what is known as the instantaneous velocity v at the time t. It is sometimes also written by this fashionable symptom, uh, symbol called ddt of s which is called the derivative of the function s with respect to the time t computed at the time t. If you are more, if you are slightly confusing, you can put this as t naught if you want. So, I am exactly looking at the time t naught. So, then you can write this at time t equal to t naught, that is it. So, this is nothing. So, when Lord Kelvin, who, who, whose name you must have known for the notion of absolute 0, minus 273 degrees Celsius, was taking a class in Cambridge and people were getting rather fussed about this notion of derivative, he was taking a calculus class. He simply told, do not get so much worried about it, this is nothing but the velocity. So, here the first idea of this intuitive idea of the limit comes from trying to understand the motion of a body. Now, this was just one category of function where the, the we are looking at distance moved by a body as a function of the time elapsed. Now, as a mathematician, we take the question further. Now, uh, the mathematicians would say all this work by Newton was largely for physics for motion of bodies. It was Leibniz who got into more asking more general question and later on Euler who took it up in much more detail is that uh, when I have a general function y equal to f x and when x move towards a real number a, of course, f is a function on a real number line when f is just a function say from r to r or from some interval a b to r does not matter, you can that is your choice. Now, when x goes to a, where does y go? That is the question. Now, the interesting part of this whole issue is that first of all, what is the meaning of x going to a? The whole question is what is the meaning of x going to a? See, we are here in this course not to show you very basic how calculation of limits or doing you know very simple calculations and showing you what is done in a class. This is a course for the ambitious people who I have mentioned in my introduction and hence we are essentially looking at concepts at the first place. So, concepts are of central importance in this course rather than just showing you ex examples by which you can pass exams because uh, somewhere the subject must come first and other things has to take a back seat. So, where does y go? Now, you might ask me what is the meaning of x going to a or what is the meaning of delta t going to 0 and when, when I was in my 11th standard, this was the equation our teacher wrote on the board and we were quite finding it pretty strange because we hardly understood, we, do, we had no teaching knowledge of the calculus. So, we asked our physics teacher what do you mean by this? What is meaning of delta t goes to 0? He says, oh, the delta t tends to 0 in the limit. We asked him, what is the meaning of limit? This is a story I tell to many of my students. He said, you see, limit means coming, coming, but still not coming, which might appear that uh, is a piece of joke, but you know, it is somewhere it is essentially the true fact. So, what does x goes to a mean? So, here on the number line is your real number a. What is the meaning of x going to a? 
Now, x can approach a from either side, from both side, either from the right or from the left. So, x can come approach a from this side, x can approach a from this side, but x need not be exactly equal to a, may not jump on to a. So, here, so if, I, if x comes from this, so we say x goes to a from the left side a minus and x goes to a from the right side a plus. So, it, this is called the right hand approach and the left hand approach. So, when I am meaning x going to a, I am trying to mean that you know I can take the variable x variable move from any of the sides. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that where does y go? I want to mean by where does y go is that if I make a x approach from either this side or that side, what is the value of y? Well, what is the value of y? Where is the value of y going? We say that the y value goes, if y value goes to a particular value l, so if y goes to l or the function value goes to l, that is goes to l, when x goes to a, means it does not matter whether x is moving to a from right side or left side, the f x value goes to l. Then only we will say, in that case we will only say that l is the limit of the function, limit of the function as x goes to a. So, what it means by f x going to l? It tells you that f x is somewhere near l, the f x value. We, uh, that f x value could be on the right side of l and could be on the left side of l. See x need not be a because the function itself need not be defined at a. So, here is my maybe not defined at a and then it is like this. It is a function. So, now, so this is suppose this is your l. Those who know some calculus, you might understand what I am trying to do. But suppose this, this is the L that you say that it approaches. So, what it means? So, whenever I find an x such that f x is very near L, either this side or that side, I should be able to tell you a corresponding x near A. That if I say x is near L, f x is near L, you have to show that f x is also near A. Then only it means that f x is going to L when x is going to A. Whenever I repeat it again, which is very very crucial, that whenever x is going, if, if you take f x value via very near l, you have to tell me whether the x that you have chosen of that for that f x is actually near l, actually near a. You cannot say f x is very near l and x is somewhere very far from a. Then this whole thing doesn't stand a chance. This little fact that if you claim that you have a f x value near L, you have to also show that that corresponding x must be also near A. That is exactly the meaning that f x, f x would be near L whenever x is near A. So, or rather whenever x is near A, f x must be near L. So, if you tell me a f x, if you give me an f x near L, you should be able to show me that x is near A. If x is far from A, does not matter, right. For example, I will tell you, give you an ex example of a function like this. So, let me define the function f x is equal to 1 when x is negative is equal to 2 when x is positive. So, when it is 1, is negative and it is 2 when it is positive. Now, here the function is taking either 2 or 1, 
So, whatever x you will take either it will take 2 or 1. Now, if you claim that f x takes the limit as 1, okay. Now, suppose I take a x here, a y here, a functional, uh, a functional value. So, suppose I say that in this case the limit of f x as x tends to 0. So, now suppose I claim here in this case that limit of f x as x tends to 0 is actually 1. Uh, sorry, yeah. So, suppose now here is a point I have chosen here. So, here is my 1. So, I have taken some length of very small length say 1 plus 1 tenth and this is 2 by 10. So, this is 1 plus 1 by tenth and 1 minus 1 by tenth. So, this is my interval that I have taken within that interval that open interval 1 plus 1 by 10 and 1 minus 1 by 10 I take any point. So, I have to show that the corresponding x here, the corresponding x here the, in this particular case. So, given this x, this value, is there any corresponding x for which if x is near 0 and it gives you the same value, there is no corresponding x because the function takes only the value 1. So, okay, order 2. So, you might say okay, fine. So, this is a very stupid thing to do to take a value near 1 because the function does not take the value 1. Okay. Then what should I, so what are the values it is taking? 2. So, I can now only consider the function value either 1 or 2. So, 2 is it, a, can it be considered around uh, so, it is within say this particular neighborhood of 1, right. Now, in this neighborhood, the functional values could be just 1 or 2. Now, 1 does not corresponding to any x on this side, but if you shrink the neighborhood, if you shrink the neighborhood, then obviously, you cannot get any functional values. So, what it appears is the following is that in this very special looking case you where you have only two choices and when you approach from the left you come towards one and you approach from the light you can come towards another you cannot talk about a limit you cannot show me up you cannot just keep on shrinking the neighborhood and every time you get a the interval every time you take a point in the interval there will be a corresponding point in a corresponding small interval around x you cannot do that. So, unless you cannot you do that you cannot show the limit exists that is your high school knowledge of having the left limit equal to right limit means that any interval around the chosen limit if you take any point in a whatever be your interval size any point that you choose in that interval must have a must have an function x value must have the, must have come from an f x x value which is in a corresponding small interval around the points a. So, it means that if you give me an interval around the limit l I should be able to tell you an interval around the point a. So, this is this can be explained by a very simple example. Okay. I will use the book of Spivak where some very fascinating examples are in place. Now, for example, I take the function y is equal to 3 of x. And let us look at x what happens when x goes to 5 you say oh it does not matter it is just 15 I know it, but no I am not talking about just doing and getting the answer I am talking here about the structure that will tell you that what you have done actually is making sense. 
see this will bring us to something called the epsilon delta argument and people will put up their hand and say oh I do not like it, it is so horrible. But please understand this is just nothing but a translation of your English language into symbols. So, that is exactly what the epsilon delta thing does. So, now I said ok, he said I said ok, so let us do an experiment. So, I give you an interval say of length 1 by 10 that is you say ok, 15 is the limit, I agree, ok, I will test your 15 is your L. So, I will take 15, so here is y is 3 x, y equal to 3 x and so here say it is 5 and this is say 15 somewhere here at 5. So, here is 15, maybe my drawing is very bad. So, now let me take an interval of length 2 by 10 totally. So, it is 15 plus 1 by 10 and 15 minus 1 by 10, ok. And now, once we have done this, so what have we done? We have done the following. So, I am telling ok. So, you say that your limit L right is such that you take any point here, any point let me take any point y. So, I take a point y equal to 3 x such that 3 x value is lying between 15 plus 1 by 10 and maybe I should rub the board and do it better. 15 minus 1 by 10. So, now I am just getting a value. So, for me I made a small interval, it could be lesser, it could be bigger also, but lesser is what is required. You always understand this is whole story comes from this instantaneous velocity business. So, you have to shrink the intervals. So, I will take a function for a, so take a functional value 3 x for some x where it is lying between. Uh, 15 plus 1 by 10 and 15 minus 1 by 10. So, subtracting 15 from both sides I have 1 by 10 x minus 5 x, x minus 15. I am subtracting 15 from all the sides ok. Now, what what sorry 3 x minus 15. So, what I will now do I will divide all the sides by 3. It, is, it can be done because we are doing a division by a positive number. So, what do I get? I get minus 1 by 10 less than x minus 5 less than 1 by 10. Sorry, I had divided by 3. So, I have to have 1 by 30 here. Sorry for the mistake. Now, what does this mean? So, x must now lie. So, x where should x lie? So, x should lie in the following interval. So, this whole thing can also be written as x minus 5 is strictly lying by 30. If you look at this argument very carefully, you replace your 10 by any epsilon that you want. Epsilon, why I am talking about epsilon? Because it is a standard in mathematics. And who has made it standard in mathematics? A uh, very famous French mathematician called Cauchy. So, all these definitions that you see here was brought in by Cauchy, well into the late uh, 18th century. So, it is Cauchy's book which gave modern calculus this flavor. So, I am able to talk about the structure. So, any x which is lying within this zone 1 plus 30 from 5 either from this side or that side would give me this. So, if you give me a functional value which is this close to the limit, I will give you an x which is that this close to a one x, I will give you, I will show that the corresponding x s must lie within this particular band, band around this point a, your 5 is your a, x tending to 5, so x is your a. So, what does it mean? Of course, I am not taking 
x equal to 5. Now, what does it mean? So, give me any epsilon, I will give you some other number delta. So, here if my epsilon was 1 by 10, my delta is actually one third of epsilon. So, it, you, you can just replace it this with epsilon because anyway you will divide by 3 and you will simply get this answer 5 minus ep, 1 third epsilon 5 plus 1 third epsilon. So, from mathematical point of view what is now the meaning of a limit. So, with this definition we will uh, end the discussion and we will give one more example how to show for a very very curious kind of example to show that two examples that how to really find out this epsilon delta and an example in the next class showing that why when in what situations even by this epsilon delta argument you can show that limits do not exist right. So, these are the conceptual framework that we have to really get into our mind. So, do not get too much pissed off by this epsilon delta thing that I am going to write now, you might just forget it, but you just have to remember this fact. If x is, if f x is very near y, is x very near uh, a? That is the question. If you, if you can show it every time, then you have actually showed that f x goes to L when x goes to a. So, if f x is very near L, is x very near a? that is what you have to show. So, these epsilon and delta are quantification of these words nothing else. So, so when I am writing this statement, a statement which many of you must be knowing very well a statement like this, it means given any epsilon greater than 0 no matter how small does not matter. there exists, so this meaning is this, there exists delta greater than 0 such that whenever 0 is strictly greater than x minus a modulus less than delta means whenever x is in the neighborhood of a plus delta and a minus delta with x not equal to a that is why we have kept this symbol. We have the difference between f x minus l to be less than epsilon. So, whenever x is near a f x is near l. So, whatever be the nearness you want of f x from l, I will give you a corresponding nearness. You might say oh it looks very funny because you sometimes say okay, whenever f x is near l show me that x is uh, near a, but why cannot I think about the reverse thing that I tell you okay, x is very near a. Hmm. I tell you x is I give you x very near a, okay. but show that f x f x is near l when I, in what bound f x should be to how much. This is a very tricky question because sometimes what would happen is that that for some intervals some small intervals you might show this that there is a corresponding one, but from for some other intervals you might not be if you make it smaller you might not be able to show the function could be that bad. So, that is why it is always important to say that I already know that f x is I I am choosing f x from the intervals very near l. If I know that x is very near a my job is much more clear rather than looking into the reverse direction that if I give us x near a is f x near l of course, in most cases that would be true, but in some cases things might be slight not, not so easy to get to mm, that is why the reverse uh, reverse thing that what would happen 
is not easy to guess. Now, one interesting thing is that one another reason why this approach is much more useful because if you give me the epsilon the neighborhood in which you want f x to lie then from that I can tell you which x should correspond to this f x whether that x is actually in a neighborhood small neighborhood around a. So, this calculation is actually much more simpler that is why we try to define limit now it has now become a definition that whenever you tell me the distance I want f x to be from L I should corresponding to this epsilon there must be a delta such that every x for which f x value f, f takes this value f x must be in that neighborhood the delta neighborhood ok. That is the simple idea. So, again I am repeating and ending this lecture that whenever x is near a whenever x is near a we should have f x near L that is that is the st standard way of looking at it because the, it says limit x tends to a when f x is equal to L. But a more structural way of looking at it is that first ascertain for example, you can functions you can have functions like this right I am just telling you. here there, there is a disc, there is a small break here see you take this neighborhood around say 0 and take any any one of them as the limit this value or this value there is a small gap between them and take a small say I, I say that ok corresponding to this. So, ok what are the f x s? So, f x s are all in these are the f x s corresponding to this right. So, the f x s all the f x values are within this zone right this particular zone right. So, f x value is within that. So, here if I magnify it here there is a small gap here and from the x that the the interval that you chosen around x if I say this is the limit it shows that f x values are within this so I can all it shows here or maybe if we choose a limit like this I can still shrink the interval and okay it might you might just find the limit values are here. Then any f x value that it that you have here any f x value that you have here right. Hmm. So, wh whatever value that you have here in this place I can choose a very small whatever f x value I. So, what is happening that here I have made this small interval and corresponding to which you uh, these x values are coming from this small interval. So, I have some values around a small interval of x and immediately I can have the f x values lying within this interval, but this is this function does not have a limit. You see it does not have a limit because ultimately they would give me two different values if I come from both sides if you look at it in the traditional sense. So, in that even if I look at it the traditional sense going from a distance around x around a to a distance around l is not the correct idea. The correct idea is to come from the distance around l. So, once I am sure that f x is lying within that neighborhood for whatever be the neighborhood however small. So, for example, if my neighborhood content this any point here then for this zeros here you see what is happening for this excess here the function for this this particular excess here for example, very small neighborhood hmm, for very particular excess here very small neighborhood there are functional values at this point right because suppose this function is increasing suppose like this. 
So, for very small if the neighborhood is very small at the upper part there are no functional values. So, you might be tricked by the fact that because in this part there is no functional value corresponding to this part corresponding to x equal to 0 this part the values are all here. So, in this part there is no x for which. So, you are telling whatever effects I am having here they are actually corresponding to x's here. So, you have given me a small x around I am showing ok they are around a small neighborhood of f x, but that is not true because in this part there is no functional value. I have to pick up a point anywhere in this neighborhood. So, I have to take the limit point and I can take any point in that neighborhood other than L if I take any other point there must be a corresponding x which is near A that is the meaning of limit. Here it is a very bad trick the function does not really have a limit, but I am taking a situation where I know that this upper part this upper part does not have any functional values it does not correspond to any point here does not corresponding to any x here, but I say ok all the values here is uh, for, uh, for these f x that I have taken x's that I have taken all the values of f x are here come from here. So, because you have already given a very you have chosen your neighborhood around x in such a way that you get a small neighborhood around f x where f x values a part of that on the top does not have a, this part does not have any x then there is no functional values here there is no x for which any point here is a functional value. But here everything is a functional value within that small neighborhood this part this is these are the functional values. So, what we will say ok I have taken a such a small neighborhood. So, I am getting a small neighborhood for whatever all the functional values are lying within that small neighborhood from here. So, I have taken any, any functional values that I am getting on that neighborhood is actually corresponding to some x in that neighborhood means you have actually here done the reverse thing you have taken some neighborhood very a near x and you are showing that now I am taking only those x's for which these are corresponding to values of f x from here are in that neighborhood. So, I have x values which are in that neighborhood so I can forget about the rest. So, this is a very tricky thing and this has to come into your mind that this is not the correct approach to go from the x thing to the f x thing you have to always come from the f x thing to the x thing that what it does not matter whatever be the interval any point that I choose it must corresponding correspond to an f x. This may not happen in this sort of situation where limits do not exist you may have an interval around f x where it does where a point does not corresponding to a given interval you have already chosen around x. So, you cannot choose an interval around x a priori you have to choose around f x and you have to make sure whatever be your point you choose in that interval must correspond in correspond to an f of x the y must be f of x where x is in some neighborhood which is which is near which is a small neighborhood around that point around the point. So, this is something extremely important which is hardly taken care of. So, we will uh, give some more discussions in the next lecture. Thank you.